Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm glad that you're here. Oh, I'm glad for all that the Lord is doing in our church. I'm glad for all that the Lord is doing on the earth right now in the midst of difficulty to see so many people pull together and do the work of the Lord. I actually had a, a truck driver that I talked to this week in the midst of some of the, the things that we're doing, and it was the coolest thing to hear this person who I don't know what their faith is, I don't know where they come from, and as we were getting off the phone, uh, say, instead of saying goodbye, said, amen, let's go do God's work, click, into the call. I'm like, that was awesome, I love it. <laughs> so thank you guys for doing the work of the Lord, and thank you for being with us this morning. If you're on the other side of a screen somewhere, welcome to you as well. We're glad that you're here and uh, glad that you're part of what the Lord is doing in our church, and we welcome the opportunity to be part of your life and what the Lord is doing with you and the kingdom wherever you happen to be watching from this morning. The Lord has a message for us today, and it's a good thing because nobody would just want to hear me talk. <laughs> it's a good thing it's a message from... <laughs> That's not where you're supposed to amen. <laughs> nobody wants to listen to me. Amen, preacher. <laughs> it's not exactly the sort of feedback. Anyway, no, I hope you're not here just to hear me. You should be here to hear the Lord. But the Lord has a message for us this morning out of Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. I know, we know these passages. It's like, oh, it's another one of those. No, I don't ever, I hope we never actually feel that way. I've met people that feel that way. It's like, oh, I know that verse. I know that passage. It's like, no, let's hear what the Lord says. Because anytime the Lord speaks, it's important. That's a good place to Amen. I don't usually solicit those, but if you're going to this morning, that's a good spot. Anytime the Lord speaks, it's important. If you give titles to your notes, this message is called The Birthplace of Vision. The Birthplace of Vision. If you come with me to back at chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 2. The Lord said to me, write down this vision. Clearly, inscribe it upon tablets so that one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end, and it will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it certainly will come and will not be late. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning for your people and for your word, and that they have gathered to hear it today. I pray, Lord, that we would hear from you and that your purpose would be accomplished here in nothing less than that. Remove any human distraction or any filter that would stand between us, any, any bit of our humanity that would cause us to hear something different than the word that you have for us today, right now, remove that and shut it down so that the power of your spirit can work in the heart and the minds of your people. I pray that I will speak clearly for your purpose and that once we've heard what you have to say, Lord, that we will be empowered and better equipped to go and do the very work that you've called us to do when we leave this room. In your name we pray. Amen. The birthplace of vision. Well, let's start just by talking about what that is. Obedience is the birthplace of vision. Where does vision start? It begins when we start to be obedient to the Lord. God reveals people to us, or God reveals himself to people whenever we seek him. Salvation is available whenever we say, yes, Lord. When we do what Jesus said in Mark 1.15 and we repent and believe, and when we do what Jesus said in Matthew 4.19, he says, follow me. That's one of 23 times that he says, follow me. Salvation begins when we repent and believe and we begin following him. It's the obedience to follow him that allows us to begin to see things the way he sees them. If you need a vision for your life, if you need a vision for your church, if you need to know what is God doing in my life in this place, in the world, in this moment, I ask you this right now. Are you being obedient to the Word of God? Have you put yourself in a place to actually begin to see from His perspective? Because if you are not where He is and you're not walking in step with Him, there is no possible way for you to see things from His point of view. Very simple example. Until one of you in this room would come and stand right here, you would have no idea what I'm looking at right now. You could look around the room and you could see the people and you could see things, but you don't have this perspective. I'm not saying I'm exalted and I'm special. I'm talking just about physically speaking. You have to put your feet in this spot to see what I'm looking at with my eyeballs, okay? Don't get too deep on me yet. Likewise, I cannot see what you're seeing unless I sit there or sit there or sit there. I have no way to see things. 
we oftentimes think, I'm just going to read the Word of God, and I'm going to come to the altar, and I'm going to have somebody pray for me, and then I'm going to suddenly walk away with this great vision from the Lord, and then we leave the building expecting to carry that concept with us, and God's just going to show us one day. But if you're not walking with Him, and sitting with Him, and sleeping where He sleeps, and moving when He moves, you won't be in the place for Him to show you, this is what I see, and this is what must be done. Obedience is the birthplace of vision. Follow me, says the Lord, and I will show you what I see, and I will give some direction to your life. That phrase, follow me, that I referenced from Matthew 4, 19, it actually comes from two different words. One of them means to draw close for the sake of seeing something new. So if we want to follow the Lord, we've got to be close to the Lord so that we can see something new. If I want to see something different, I can stand here. I'm slightly closer, and I'm slightly higher, and I may be out of frame on the camera, and so what? It illustrates the point. If I want to see something different, I have to go to a different place. I can't see what it looks like from there unless I go there. So follow me. Draw close to the Lord for the sake of seeing something different. If you're not happy with the way that your walk and your life look, then stop standing in one place and expecting the view to change because the world does not rotate around you and God is not going to change your environment just to give you a different view of what's happening. What he will change is you and the way he changes you is he says, come with me and see what I'm doing and let me show you something you've not considered. The second word that forms this phrase, follow me, it means to leave behind. To leave, in fact, in context, it means to leave all else behind. We could get very quickly on board with the idea. It's like, okay, I want to see something different. I want to see something new. I've got to climb this mountain. I've got to go down to this valley. I've got to walk around this corner. I've got to move to a new town. I've got to stand two steps higher on the ladder, whatever it is. I need to see something from a new perspective. Great, I'll go where God is, and I'll see that. And he says, but by the way... Don't bring any of that stuff from where you were with you. You have to leave everything else behind in order to truly follow the Lord. Because what happens if I'm trying to drag all the stuff that I had with me before along? For a while, I can keep up with the Lord. All right, this is good. And then we get so far and who. Oh, You good? Oh, yeah, I'm going to make it. I'm fine. You know, you could put some of that stuff down. No, 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 I'm good. I can make it. It's good cardio. Get those gains, bro. I'm going to get there, right? And then we start to find out suddenly I I can't run like that anymore because I'm dragging this stuff with me. And the Lord is, he's just a couple of steps ahead. He's not that far. I can still see him from here. And then we continue and we get to the point that we wear down and we're tired and we're dragging whatever we're holding on to and we're also beginning to drag ourselves and we find that the Lord is so far ahead that for a minute he dips behind the hill and I can't get there. Hey, Lord, wait up. I said, follow me. And then we get to the top of the hill and we realize he's on the next hill. Now I got to go through this valley by myself, dragging my stuff from where I was. The Lord says, follow me, not because, oh, not because it's going to be easy, but because it's what's necessary in order to see things from his perspective and get where you're going in the time he wants you to be there and to have his protection the whole way. To follow me means I'm going to see something new, but I got to leave this stuff behind me. See, repentance allows us to have that first vision of the Lord, but obedience to follow him is what gives us the opportunity to see from his perspective, and that's an ongoing thing. I don't get to be obedient once and then get everything that he promised. It's a process of obedience. I'm thrilled if my kid took the garbage out yesterday, but the kitchen stinks today because it's got to be done again. The Lord is thrilled that you repented yesterday. The Lord is thrilled that you were obedient yesterday. And when he said, go to this place and meet these people and say this thing, that's wonderful. But are you still following? Or did you expect that to be the one thing that just gave it all right now? This is a process and it's ongoing. The vision always comes at the cost of leaving everything else behind to keep my eyes on him. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul is writing at the end of his life, and he says, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race. Hang on to that phrase. I've kept the faith. There is reserved for me in the future the crown of righteousness. Keep that phrase, in the future, 
in mind. It is reserved for me in the future the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Paul writes this note, and Paul finished his earthly race, saying the vision of God is still in the future. Because I'm still drawing breath and I still live on this earth. And even though I know my life is physically coming to an end until I have passed out of this body, the vision of God is still for the future. It lies before me and ahead of me. And it's not right this minute. There's reserved for me in the future what God has promised. Let's look at another verse together. Philippians 3, 12 through 15. Paul writing again. Not that I've already attained it, but I make every effort to press on so that I may lay hold of it because I have been laid a hold of by Jesus Christ. One thing that I do, I forget what is behind and I reach forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's call in Christ Jesus. Everyone who is mature thinks this way. Ooh, maturity. We're lacking something in our maturity when we think I was obedient yesterday or I've been obedient for a year or I've been obedient for X amount. And so now I deserve the prize. Haven't I done enough, Lord, that you would come through and do the thing that you said? Paul says it's in the future and I forget what's behind. That means I don't stand on yesterday's word to keep me current with what God is doing today. God said, yesterday do this thing, but today I've got a new thing for you to do. I can't drag yesterday with me, even if what I'm dragging is the good stuff that God did in the past. I can certainly look back at that as a memorial. I can remember and say that is evidence that if I keep following him, he'll work, because I followed him to that place. But I can't rip everything from that place up and drag it with me to the next one. I'm reaching forward and I forget what was behind. And this is how mature people think. The rest of verse 15 says, if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this to you. Mature people are saying the the vision of God is out there and I have to pursue it. And if you're at a place where you realize, ooh, perhaps I don't think that way, it's okay. This is not a beat you up message because the Lord says, I am aware there are times when you will lose sight and you will forget and you will no longer feel like going and you will even get in your feelings and say, but I did enough. Can't I just, the Lord says, I know that that's going to happen. So if you reach a place where you realize I am not as mature as I should be, the Lord says, that's okay. I'll reveal that to you and we'll walk forward from there too. Don't beat yourself up about what hasn't happened. The fact that the vision God gave you hasn't come to pass yet does not mean he's left you. And the fact that you realize I've made some mistakes does not mean you're so imperfect. God can't do the thing that he said. He's made provisions for all of the above. Follow me and leave this stuff behind. And if you realize I've reached a point where perhaps I'm dragging this or perhaps I'm a bit immature, he says, that's all right. I have revealed that to you. Let's get that out of the way and let's move on. Follow me is still valid. The vision is still true. The cost of receiving his vision. See, that's the difficult part because the vision of God is always for the future. Paul says the appointed time. That means it's out there somewhere. It's not always for the moment that you receive it. The vision that God gives you is not always for right this minute. There's a reason that he says write this down. There's a reason that the Lord says, remember this so that you don't forget, because there's going to come some difficulty. There's going to come a process of getting from where we are to there. So the moment that you sit down in your place of prayer, or the moment that you kneel at the altar, or the moment that you have someone pray for you, or you read that Bible verse that suddenly makes everything click, and it's all so clear, and it makes so much sense, remember that it's for an appointed time. It may very well be for right now, but most of the time, it's something to come that we must remember and not forget. And we've got to continue to follow the Lord. When God gives us the vision, it's often at the cost of both the past and the present. I can't stay in this moment forever. If I want to see what God just showed me happen, I've got to follow him. I can't tie myself to that blade of grass that grandma got saved on in 1961 and say that that's the only place the anointing is. I've got to move to where God's moving right now. The reason so many people fail is because what we want is the vision of God right now. Reminds me of a commercial. I need cash now. 
I want what the Lord is going to do right this minute. Give it to me. The Lord says, I've given you a vision, but now there is a process. I've given you salvation, but it's not complete until you get to heaven. I've begun doing a work in you, but I still need to develop you. Will you trust me? Will you follow me? So many people fail because they want it right now. Don't be deceived into believing that right now it should happen or it wasn't true. Likewise, don't be deceived into thinking that the first time something successful happens, that's the fullness of the goal. Some people make it past, I got a vision and I held on for six months or a year or 10 years and then I began to see what God was doing and they think that's the fullness of it, I'm done because it's the first time they saw success. This is the thing. Don't let the enemy lie to you and rob you of the rest of what God promised you. Don't camp out on the one good thing that God finally did. Don't stop short simply because the results satisfy you personally. Do not stop pursuing the goal and the vision of God until God is satisfied. We have to continue to pursue the vision so that it satisfies Christ and the Spirit of God that's within us. Because it would be very easy for us to say, look at the wonderful thing that we've done for our community. This is what God has for us. And we could camp there. Look at the wonderful thing God has done in my life. Look at the job that he gave me. Look at the spouse that he's finally brought. Now I have arrived. No, follow me, says the Lord. The vision is for an appointed time. This is but one of many successes and failures and celebrations and difficulties along the way because Paul got to the end and said, it's still for the future. My life has been poured out and it's almost over, but it's still for the future. God's still looking ahead. We can't let the human measure of success dissuade us from continuing our pursuit of the full vision of God. Success does not mean that we go into maintenance mode. Look at the great thing God's done. How can we keep this happening? How can we keep this going? What must we do? How can we maintain these results? We got lots of salvations this way, so now this is how we evangelize. We got lots of people to show up to our events, so now this is what we do every year. We like this translation of the Bible, so we refuse to read any other one. We like this worship song and in worshiping in this style. We refuse to do it another way because this works for us. Oh, success does not mean we begin to maintain the results. The moment that you shift from pursuing the vision to maintaining the results, you sign your spiritual death certificate. Proverbs 28 or 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. If there is not still something for me to pursue, I will die. If there's not something for our church, if there's not something for your family, if there's not something for the kingdom of God that I'm still pursuing, if there's not still a vision of God ahead of me that I have to follow and keep up with, I'm actively in the process of dying. Because I'm just trying to maintain the results of what the Lord did yesterday, and now it's last week, and now it's last year, and now 15 years ago. And now I remember when it happened for Grandma, I wish it was like that again. We've got to hold fast to the vision of the Lord and not hold on so tightly to the results that His work produces. We're to, we've talked about this some on Wednesday nights in our study on the Holy Spirit. Matthew 15, 16 says that the signs follow people that believe. That means we're moving forward and what He did yesterday is back there. What He did five minutes ago is back there. If you've seen the Lion King, dunk, why did you do that? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> the results of what God is doing are not the goal. The vision of God is the goal. Pursuing God and staying in the presence of God is the goal. Following him from now until the day we see him face to face is the goal. The results that we sometimes get so focused on are the aftermath of pursuing Christ. It what, it's what happens because God has been there, but I want to be where God is and in what he's doing. I don't want the line to be drawn where I got off the bus at this point. You know, some people do that with fashion. It's a good analogy. We ride along the fashion train, and that's great. Until we get to maybe our, our mid-20s or if we're in the business world and we find a new kind of fashion that we have to get into. Okay, well, maybe so in my 30s or 40s. But we reach a point where it's like, I'm not wearing those shoes. Those look stupid. 
I'm not going to wear that kind of shirt. I've, have you seen what they're doing with their socks? I'm not doing that. That's dumb. And we decide, I am off the fashion train now, and it's going to keep going without me. Don't do that with your walk with Christ. Don't do that with the vision of the Lord where you say, the results that I've s- achieved are significant enough and sufficient for me, and I'm going to hang out right here till he comes back. The results are not the goal. The results are the aftermath of us continuing to follow him. If we focus on the results, we're walking backwards. Vision keeps us focused on the presence and the purpose of God. It keeps us moving forward. It keeps us actively in the kingdom. Nothing can take the place of your vision of God. Don't let anything take the place of the vision God has given you. And once he's placed it in you, don't lose sight of him and let it die. Keep him in your sights. We can't ever look at things and say, this is how we do it. We've got to always be looking for where is God and what is he doing right now. Obedience to follow him is the only way this happens. If you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, there's a wonderful song about this as well. To everything, turn, turn, turn. You know this one, right? Come straight out of this verse. There is a season for everything and a time for every purpose under heaven. That's the Bible. That's not pop music. The more you know. Dun, dun, dun. There's a season for everything. What worked before won't necessarily work again. What we've done in the past isn't necessarily what we need to try to repeat. The method that works right now will very swiftly become obsolete when we're in an advancing kingdom. And make no mistake, we are. Scripture is extremely clear that we are in an advancing kingdom and we have to keep the vision of the Lord before us. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, the verse we started with, tells us, write the vision so you can run with it. Not write the vision and cast your net by this lake and never another one and pitch your tent before that wall where you've written it so that you may gaze upon it and remember the great day that the Lord said that thing. Write it so you can run with it. He didn't say set up camp or build an altar or make a memorial and stay there. We may need to return to that place so we don't forget, but we should be running with what we know and following after the Lord as far as he will go. See, Peter made a mistake at one point in his life. You know, you remember Peter from the Bible? Poor Peter, he's always getting picked on because he did make quite a few mistakes. And the truth of the matter is, we would all love to be Paul, but a lot of us are a whole lot more like Peter than anyone else in Scripture. We're constantly screwing up just as big and just as famously as we're successful, and people tend to remember the screw-ups more than they remember the successes. Which in my book makes Peter one of the greatest guys to read about because he's the most relatable person in Scripture. I can never be like Paul. But there's a chance I could be like Peter. Peter made a suggestion at the transfiguration of Jesus. He goes up on top of the mountain with Jesus, and he's one of the very few, one of the very special, one of the elect. And he gets to stand with the Lord and watch this event happen where Jesus takes on his heavenly form for just a moment in front of them. And it's a beautiful thing. And when the event is over in Matthew 17, 6, Peter says, Lord, we should just build an altar here. We should build a memorial here, and we should just come here, and we should pray, and we should make this the place that we gather, and this the thing that we do, and this the thing that we remember and talk about for the rest of our lives, this one thing that happened right here. We should build an altar and stay here, and the next verse, Jesus looks at him, and he says, get up. We have work to do. Follow me down the mountain. He says, follow me down the mountain because there's more work of the gospel to be done. We've got to continually be following him. God's vision does not change, but the way we accomplish it changes as often as we are willing to move with him. What he's told you to accomplish stays the same, but how you're going to get it done changes as you move with him. We follow him where he leads. I told you we're part of an advancing kingdom. Isaiah 9, 7 speaks of this. That's Old Testament. And Matthew eleven twelve 12 also speaks of this. That's New Testament. That hasn't changed. God leads an advancing kingdom. You can look those up. We'd be here forever if I read every verse I pulled from this morning. (laughs) Write those down and look them up for yourself. But we serve a God who is advancing and a kingdom that is advancing and a government, heavenly speaking, that is always getting bigger. 
So if we want to stay in the vision of God, we've got to move with it. We've got to advance with it. So how we accomplish his vision of bringing hope and reaching people with the truth of the gospel will change if we are following him because he's definitely leading us somewhere. Leadership implies movement. We're going to a place. If we're just going to sit here and keep doing the same thing, you just kind of need the supervisor. You ever had one of those at work? There's a difference in a supervisor and a leader. There's a huge difference in someone who would sit and say, now, church, this is the way we're going to do things forever. There's a big difference in having a supervisor just sits at work and says, no, we need to make sure we follow all the policies and all the procedures and we'll always do things exactly this way so nothing ever changes. That's a supervisor. A leader says, I see some things that need to be different. There's a place that we need to go. I want to inspire you to do something more than just check the boxes and call it a day. The Lord is leading us somewhere. Movement in that is implied. Something is going to change. Vision is birthed from the obedience to follow when the leader said, here's where we're going. Because the vision remains as only as long as you can see the Lord. John in Revelation 1.19, he got told to write down what you see and everything that you see after this. The Lord says, I'm going to show you something, and I know there's going to come a time when it's difficult to accomplish it or when you forget it or your feelings get in the way, so write it down so you don't lose it. We do this so that we remember things, not just so that we remember what the vision is, but it helps us when we have one of those days when we get caught up and we think, this is it. This is all there is. I guess this is what God had in mind. When the enemy wants to make you settle for what you're in and say, oh, you can modify your perspective on God's vision to fit where you're sitting so you'll feel like you did something. It's a lie. We had a lighthearted and fun exchange about that this morning on this stage just a few minutes ago. Like, I've gained some weight this week. I don't know how I did that as busy as I've been. Well, it's probably water weight. Well, you could have said it was muscle. (laughs) Perspective, right? Sometimes we'll take our circumstances and we'll say, I can adapt the vision of the Lord to make it seem as if the vision has been accomplished here. Sometimes we will get in our feelings about something and say, I need to feel better about something. So perhaps if I look at it from over here, it'll look a little bit more like something I could say, maybe that's what God said. Don't do that. You write the vision down so you can remember what I'm in is not the end. This is not the vision. I need to realize that nothing I'm going to find on earth is the goal or the vision or the end result. Nothing I see here is the end. Whether I am frustrated that I haven't achieved what I hoped I would or whether I've done the biggest thing I think I could possibly do, we write the vision down so we can remember it's still out there. This is not the end. No matter how good or how bad this is, the kingdom of God is still advancing. I still have to follow. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. I'm going to paraphrase that for you. He says, don't accumulate treasure here. Store it up in heaven. Don't look at all the nice stuff you have here. Realize that heaven is where the real reward lays for you. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. If my heart becomes focused on the accomplishments that I have here, I will will accelerate how quickly I lose sight of the Lord. If I'm too focused on what's here, the Lord is still walking and I'm trying to find the Lord in this and I look up and suddenly it seems like only a moment has passed, but he couldn't have gotten that far that fast. It's because we lose track of time. I mean, I do this when I study or if I'm playing a game that I like or if I'm playing guitar. I, for, I lose track of how long it's been. I'll be home in 10 minutes, honey. Did you hear her laugh out loud just now? She actually did. <laughs> She knows that if I'm hanging out with a bunch of guys playing music and I say 10 minutes, I'm, my heart and my intentions are to be home in 10 minutes, but in actuality, I'm going to look down and realize it's been 45 and I haven't even packed up my gear yet. That's just a very practical, funny, relational example on earth, but the same thing happens with the Lord, and that's what Jesus is talking about here. Don't accumulate your treasure and get so focused on it that you don't realize how far he got and how long it's been. Because where my treasure is, my heart will be. If the vision is out there and I'm focused on this, this is why we write it down. i got to realize this is not the end result. This is not the goal. 
Our vision is to stay focused upon God's purpose and our actions and reactions. They have to follow suit with the Lord. I've got to stay where he is. The only way that I can follow God in his purpose is if I take what I want to be focused on and what I think is best, whether it was things I accumulated yesterday or stuff sitting here today, the only way I'll stay in the vision of the Lord is if I say, that's got to go. At the cost of the present and at the cost of the past, I am looking to the vision of the future. I'm following the God who goes ahead of me. God gives us a vision and then he leads us there. And then here's the scary part. He only does it one step at a time. We want the vision right now. We got it at the altar. I was praying and the Lord showed me a picture. And I read this Bible verse and three people said this thing to me, so it must be true. And we hang on to that. And then a week goes by and a month goes by and a year goes by. And we wonder, where is it? But the Lord doesn't say, I'm going to give you the blueprints and the schematics right now. I've given you a picture of the final result. Now we got to do some things that don't look anything at all like building a castle. we got to dig a hole in the ground. What? How are we going to build a strong tower if i got to dig a hole in the ground? Well, because we got to put foundation. Well, what's the foundation, Lord? Well, that's, you, you dig down to some solid ground that's underneath the soft ground, and that means you got to get some stuff that you thought was a good place to put a castle. you got to get rid of it because it's not. And then i got to pour some concrete in there. In there, in there. Okay, we got a footing. Now we can start building things. No, we can't quite yet. We got some measurements to take. We got there's a process. The psalmist David talks about this in Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We like that idea, but we have these things like electric lights and LEDs that light a whole path up from start to end for us. We have no concept of what this means. David's referring to a really specific kind of lamp. When you would go walking at night in the desert back in the day when David would have had to take a walk and you're outside of town where they don't have torches outside the houses, there was, a, there was a kind of lamp. It was an oil lamp that was in an enclosed container and it hung on a chain and you would put it on your belt. It was very small. It had to be portable. And when you look down, there's only a pool of light around you about enough space to take a step or two and beyond that I can't see when David says your word is a light unto my path a lamp for my feet he literally means a lamp for my feet I have this great vision from the Lord I have a destination a place that I'm going in mind and I can see the Lord up there but really I don't want the Lord that far away I want him near me I just need him to know where to put my foot next because if I can see the destination is there but everything between me is briars and brambles and dark where's the path I see where I'm going how do I get there Lord I need a lamp at my feet and if I don't see the next step yet I hang out right here until the light reveals the next place I can safely put my foot Moving slowly and taking a step at a time does not mean that the Lord is not there. In fact, if the Lord is a lamp unto my feet, I've given you a vision. You're going to have to stay close enough to me that what I'm giving you is what you'll trust in. And you'll stop making up an idea of, but it makes more sense. I can get through here. We used to do this thing when I was at summer camp. We always had to hike up the side of a mountain, and it was several miles. It took an entire day, and it felt like it was the entire summer um, when you're 11 years old and you're hiking three miles up the side of a mountain. And the trail would wind because you know what? Going straight up the side of a hill is a little tough. And I know the campsite is up there. In fact, there was one point when we had walked a certain distance and we could get out to the side of the hill and we could see there's this place called the bald spot, which is where we're going to camp. And you can see it. We're only a third of the way up the hill, but it's right there. Why don't we just go straight through here? And some of us got this great idea that we were going to be trailblazers one year. We decided, I'm not following this path. I'm going to walk that way in a straight line as far as I possibly can. And the counselor said, <laughs> go for it. And he led us. That might have lasted 10 minutes before there were bees and there were ants and there were twigs and there were thorns. And we were exhausted from trying to climb a straight line. God didn't call you to be a trailblazer in that sense. He says, I will light your path. Walk where I show you to walk. The vision is for the future, and there's some distance that we have to cover, and he's going to show us the path, but not as much of it as we want. Because the truth is this. If the Lord showed you the whole thing at one time, it would scare you straight into hell. 
If he showed you the whole walk and if he showed you how many times he'd have to rescue you and how many times you'd have to trust him and how big that amount of trust would have to be, it would scare you to the point that you would refuse to go. If you showed me some of the things that the Lord has had me do in the course of my life when I was 15 years old, I would not be here. I would have said, Lord, there's no way. He shows it to you a piece at a time, and he leads you somewhere. He doesn't give you the whole journey. He shows you the walk. God gives us his vision, and then he remains ahead of us just enough that we see this step and that step. He's the light on the path to get there. And this is where it becomes difficult because we can settle into that idea that, okay, he's just going to be, it's a step. It's two steps. I can, and then we'll start to settle into this idea that a single well done means the vision is complete. A single well done does not mean that the vision is complete. A single successful step doesn't mean that the work that he began is done in you. Celebrate the moments that you make a successful step, but don't lose sight of the vision. Write it down. Our obedience to God's vision is the foundation, not just for you. The reason it's so important that we keep the obedience of God in front of us is because the obedience to God's vision is the foundation for another generation. This is where we do get to trailblaze some things. I don't get to look at how I'm going to make it to the vision of God myself, but when I have followed God along the right path, I leave something in my wake that people after me can follow, whether it's the people I'm leading right this minute or people that will come 10, 20, 30 years from now and say, there was once a church. There was once a people who got the vision of the Lord and followed him. And somewhere around here is the path that they took. And if we'll follow that, there's a foundation for them to find the place where the Lord says, you were obedient and now I can give you a vision that extends this farther than the one that the people before you were able to walk. God's vision is always beyond us and it's ahead of us and it builds upon the foundation of what came behind us. There are a lot of people there are a lot of people that will follow him to places they would never have gone if somebody had not gone ahead and followed the Lord first. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, don't remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. I'm about to do something new. Even now it's coming. Don't you see it? I'll make a way in the wilderness. I'll bring rivers and streams in the desert. The Lord says, I will be the trailblazer and you will follow me. And there will be a foundation for the generation behind you to follow And then when the time comes that your journey is at an end, and like Paul, you do finally pass from this earth, there will be evidence of the faithfulness of God where someone else can look and say, I can follow him if they did. I can trust him if they did. If he was faithful to them, I believe he'll be faithful to me. God makes a way where it seems like there's not one. There's a song about that too. I won't sing it. I've sung enough today. Matthew 16, 18 is a place where we see this practically happen. Peter, again, the Lord looks at him and says, Upon this rock I will build my church. Easy to get excited about that. Wonderful, great. But if you go all the way back to where Peter was standing, Peter had not seen the church. In fact, if you go back and look at Scripture, the word church that Jesus uses there hasn't been used before. Not in this context. Peter didn't see the church that we see. What Peter saw was the Lord, and he said, okay, I'll go do it. Peter didn't camp on his faith there next to the water and say, okay, Lord, you've given me a great vision. I'm going to wait here until you build a church around me. Whatever that looks like and whatever it is, I'm just going to sit here and wait for it. He didn't wait for the thing to magically spring up at the place that the Lord said, I'm going to do this thing in you. He pursued the Lord way beyond that conversation, way beyond that seashore. And he finally arrived at the destination that was the appointed place and the appointed time where the vision was declared. And now we're still sitting in it. It's always for the future. Luke 10 verses 2 and 3. Jesus is speaking to a group of people in this same way that he spoke to Peter. And now he says, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray for workers. And verse 3 says, I'm sending you. Pray for people to do the work. And by the way, here's the work for you. I've got a vision for you. 
I've got some work for you to do. Will you follow me? Will you go get it done? Pray for the people that will come after you. Pray for the people that are around you, but you keep your eyes on me. I'm sending you, says the Lord. You look at the lives of Peter and Paul and any other disciple, they, none of them stayed in one place. They were all constantly moving around. In fact, they were never just doing one thing. They were always working on more than one thing because the vision is the same, but the way we accomplish it changes. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.22 says, I've become all things to all men. It doesn't mean that he becomes something that's not Christian. It means that he learns how to witness and adapt and deal in the situation that he's in. The Lord's called me to preach the gospel. How will these people hear it? The Lord's called me to reach these people. What do they need? How do I get into their culture and have an opportunity to share this? He didn't stay in one place, and he didn't marry himself to a certain way of doing things. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9, I'll paraphrase this for you. Some people plant, some people water, but God brings the growth. And what matters the most is not the function, but the God that gave those people a purpose. Jesus looked for disciples and he called them to follow and told them to keep their eyes on him and go where he led and learn what he taught by his word and his actions. And then he took those people and said, do what I've done for you. You go do this for some others. The vision is for an appointed time and we follow him down the path that he lights one step at a time to get there. And the purpose is not just so I can do a great thing. It's because we're making a way for another generation to have a vision and further the gospel way farther out than we can even imagine. There are lifetimes of vision beyond what God will do in and through you. Your obedience ties up. Your obedience is tied not just to the vision God has for you, but it's the foundation for another generation that comes behind you. God's vision is always for the future. Today's obedience reveals God's vision for tomorrow. And that vision will remain constant and the same, and we must constantly pursue it. Seek God for something greater than today. I know today is the day of salvation, but... The vision is for an appointed time. The vision God gives, it's not immediate and it's not temporary. It lights the path toward tomorrow. So your obedience to trust him and follow him today will be the birthplace of the vision that he has for your future. If you'll stand with me, I'm just about done. The vision of God is a reminder of what will be so that you do not die on the memorial of what has already been done. God's plan for you is not for you to die on the altar of routine and vision and idea of what people before you did. God's plan for you is to say, now that you have salvation, today is secure. Let's talk about tomorrow. Will you follow me and leave behind what you've brought with you and trust me one step at a time to get you from here to something far bigger than you can imagine? As an individual, if God has given you a vision, don't despair today that you haven't seen it come to pass. It's for an appointed time. It's still out there, and it's always going to be ahead of you. The promise of the vision, oh, the promise of the vision that you haven't seen fulfilled yet is the promise that he still has work for you and plans to be with you for a long time. The fact that you have a vision for something that hasn't happened yet does not mean you have lost the plot and you have lost the Lord. What it means is that I've got a promise to be with you for a long time from here. Trust me. I've not left you. We have long-term plans, says the Lord. As a church... I'll say this, we're living in a moment of appointment. The vision is for an appointed time. We've seen God do some things this week that I could not imagine when I woke up last Monday morning. We're in a moment. But the fullness of the vision of God is not yet on us. We're blessed to begin seeing it take shape. We're blessed to be in a moment where we're seeing him do some things that confirm what he said. But this is just the light on the path for where we're at. We're blessed to see it bear weight and take shape and to bruise some fruit. But this is not the destination. Be aware of the moment that we're in, but don't camp here. If it's in your personal life or whether it's what God's doing in our church, be aware of the moment you're in and celebrate that and thank him for it, but don't camp here. We are far from the end. Keep the vision before you so that we can continue towards it because Habakkuk says, and this is not a man, this is the Lord speaking through his prophet. He prophet, he says, the vision that I've given you, it will come and it won't be late. 
be with him so you aren't either. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning for the opportunity that you've given us to be obedient. And I thank you for the opportunity that we've had to see bits and pieces of your vision take place in our life. I thank you that you have something bigger than just get saved and sit down in mind for your people. I pray this morning if there are people that can hear me speaking and they don't know that you have a vision for them, that your spirit would begin to birth it in them right now. That out of their obedience to follow, even to be here and to listen to this message, to be in your presence today, I pray that that would begin the process of birthing your vision in them, that they would see something bigger than what they're in. For those that haven't seen it happen yet, Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in them and confirm in them that, yes, this is the vision of the Lord and he is working. And the fact that it's not yet fulfilled means that there is a long, long future and promise of relationship with the Lord ahead of them. I pray that we would not camp in the place where one good thing has happened. That, Lord, you would cause us to dust off our blessed assurance and move forward and follow after you. I thank you that we're in the moment we are in, whether it be difficult or whether it be good and exciting. And I thank you that you have a future for your people. I thank you that there is a future for your people. Make it clear and plain to us, Lord. And Father, if we've not yet done it, show it to us again so we can write it down. And by the power of your spirit, remind us of what you've said so we will never again forget. It's been good to be in your presence this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your work. Thank you for wherever we are in that process and that you're in it with us. Be with us as we go. Keep us safe till you have us come back together in your name. Amen. Bless you guys. I'll see you again soon.